Hello, South Africa. John Steenhazen, your host of CoronaCast, and welcome back to CoronaCast, your twice weekly information session where we keep you up to date with the latest information relating to the COVID 19 crisis in South Africa and being able to keep you up to speed. Uh, with these developments. Well, today is day 68 of the risk-adjusted strategy, and as we've seen, uh, Monday this week saw the start of level three uh, of the lockdown. I'm sure uh, those of you who've been craving your gin and your whiskies and your beers uh, were grateful that yesterday you could go, and certainly looking at the queues uh, surrounding a number of the bottle stores in the area where I'm staying, uh, it, uh, it really was uh, a priority for many, many people yesterday. But of course, as we know, the irrational tobacco ban still stays in place and there are a number of curtailments on uh, the liberties of ordinary South Africans. We've got an action-packed uh, show for you today and a lot of parents have been writing in over the course of the week asking us about schools, about children, about how at risk children are, should schools be going back. We've seen a huge debate raging on social media around this issue. So what we've tried to do today is to bring you some facts about why the Western Cape opened schools, why we believe that it was the right thing to do, and we're going to be uh, chatting uh, a little bit about uh, children and children's uh, health during the COVID crisis. But before that, I wanted to just spend a little bit of time uh, talking about where we're at as a country. And there's some really disturbing reports that have come out in the mainstream media about just how much damage has been done to the South African economy over the course of this hard lockdown. And it's really starting to bite along amongst very, very many communities across South Africa. A report uh, two days ago, which I read, showing that over 50% of South African households are now food insecure. That is significant, that we're going to have a potential of 50% unemployment in South Africa. That is significant. But what we cannot do is allow the very problems which led us to be so low in the water going into this crisis to be the problems that exist with us going out of the crisis. This is a hinge of history moment for South Africa. As you know, a hinge can go both ways. And we need to make absolutely sure that we push the hinge as far away from the devastating policies that have got us into the crisis, that have pushed us into a six-year technical recession, that have pushed us into a situation where there was very little assistance for the country and its citizens during this crisis. And we need to push that hinge of history towards the policies that we need to reform the South African economy, to make it far more inclusive, and to be able to bring more people into prosperity. These past two decades have brought policies that have pushed over 10 million people into the unemployment queue. And that is why when we start seeing a doubling down on the very policies that have got us into this mess and that left us so vulnerable during this uh, time of crisis, I really start to get worried about what the future holds if those policies are allowed to prevail and if the hinge of history pushes leftwards uh, into the radical economic transformation phase. An example of this is we saw just in the last 24 hours, uh, a plan that's going to bail out South African airways with 21 billion rands worth of public money. Uh, this is absolute madness. And in an environment where we're going to need every cent of that 21 billion rand to help stimulate small business, to help people keep their jobs going, to uh, fund the health response, ventilators, doctors and nurses, frontline healthcare professionals. Here we are throwing good money after very, very bad money. The very paradigm that got us into the mess. And reading the document that uh, came out of the governing party over the course of the last weekend, very clear indication that their response to the economic crisis is going to be more of the same. More state control, more crowding out of the private sector, just a little bit more state intervention in sectors of the economy, prescribed assets. These are things that should worry us as South Africans. And I want to give you the commitment that we're going to fight with everything we can to make sure that we push against that hinge of history, to make sure that history bends in the right way so that we can see more South Africans lifted out of poverty and into opportunity, that we start to regain the jobs that have been lost, that we start to push South Africa onto a path of growth and prosperity off this low growth, high debt, high unemployment economy that we currently find ourselves in. And I hope that you're going to stand with us uh, in that fight as we fight for a more just, a more inclusive and a better future for South Africa. Speaking about livelihoods and the economy, we've given the uh, Minister of Cooperative Governance in Korsazan at Lamini Zuma, 
uh, up until three o'clock tomorrow to respond to our request for her to create regulations for the personal, personal health care and personal care industry uh, to be able to be opened up. As we know, almost 50% of South Africans could stand to lose their jobs in this crisis. This means that hairdressers, nail technicians, uh, people involved in the personal care industry are now sitting still in level three, unable to practice. And it simply makes no sense that the president announces that you can gather on a Sunday or any other day for religious service with 49 other people, but you cannot have your hair cut uh, in an appointment basis with a hairdresser. This doesn't make sense. It's irrational and unreasonable. And so we are now preparing to go to court to assist all those hairdressers, nail technicians and small business people who have been now cut out of opportunity. We also released a paper the last week by Manny De Freitas, and we hope to have him on the show to come and take us through it. Uh, how we can revive the tourism industry in South Africa, particularly self-catering establishments. If these can practice uh, self-isolation, uh, we should be allowing them to, op to operate and to open. We cannot afford a widespread failure in our tourism operation. And then, of course, you would have noticed that we managed to catch uh, the uh, Minister of Cooperative Governance out uh, in a fib. She told the South African public that there were over 2,000 submissions in favor of the tobacco ban that she was instituting. Well, in court papers, which have now been uh, served uh, by the state attorney uh, in a matter brought by FITA, it now appears that this was in fact not the case and that there was around about 400 uh, submissions that were made in favor. And that in the midst of 70,000 other submissions. It is simply unacceptable in a time of crisis to have a government that is not able to level and square with its citizens. What you want in a time like this is unambiguous, clear communication. The last thing we need is an element of distrust to be developed when ministers go on national television and deliberately mislead the South African public. I'll be writing to President Ramaphosa a little bit later uh, today, asking him to take disciplinary steps against Minister Nkosazana Dlamini Zuma, if in fact she has misled the nation. We have also, through our Chief Whip in Parliament, Natasha Mazzoni, lodged an Ethics Committee complaint uh, as the Minister is a Member of Parliament, and we hope that she will be answerable to the Ethics Committee for what appears to have been a gross misleading of the South African public to serve a very narrow ideological interest. But enough on that, and let's get into the meat of the show and the reason why I'm sure many of you have tuned in today, and that is to talk to my good friend and uh, our Western Cape Minister of Education, Debbie Schaefer. Debbie, welcome to Corona Cost. It's great to have you here. Thank you, John. It's great to be here on my debut on your show. Oh, well, Debbie, it's quite a week for you. Um, I see that uh, you've got the Human Rights Commission breathing down your neck. You've got all sorts of, uh, of, of people who, uh, who have you in the news. Um, and um, I just want to start off by commending you for your bravery, Debbie. Um, you know, bravery in government and, and having the courage to do the right thing in the face of, uh, of terrible opposition is always a good thing. And I, for one, think you've made the right call this week, and I want to support it. So Thank you. let's start. There's been a lot of confusion this week. Uh, you mm. and many other education ministers around the country were briefed. Schools were going to open on the 1st. A government gazette is printed indicating that you marshal your department, you get everything ready. And then about seven or eight hours before schools are due to open, uh, something else comes out. You want to just take us through that? What is the situation right now? Yeah, it was a rather unfortunate situation, I must say. We, for the last number of weeks, we've been engaged in discussions with the national minister. And in fact, she made a public announcement to the effect that she was aiming for us to open on the 1st of June and that we were all working towards that. We did exactly that. Our officials worked extremely hard. Our schools worked extremely hard. Principals, governing bodies, even in some schools, worked towards ensuring that all the required safety measures were put in place so that we could receive the learners. And then suddenly um, over the weekend, uh, there was a, a Council of Education Ministers meeting and some people started suggesting maybe we should just, you know, mop up this week instead of going back. And it was a very, very long discussion, but the ultimate result wasn't, there was no decision mm -hmm. as such, despite what has been uh, suggested by some people in the media. Um, and we then met with the unions and all of a sudden the unions 
the minister specifically told the unions that we were she was still consulting with other role players and that we would then communicate our decision. But before we knew it, um, Sunday Times on Sunday morning had uh, information from the unions that se seemed to suggest that we were not going to go back to school. Of course, that put a lot of uh, people into a state of confusion. Um, and the minister was scheduled to make an announcement on um, Sunday afternoon. It was four, then it was six. And then just before six, we heard it was postponed to Monday. So unfortunately, we had to make a decision because I was being asked what on earth is going on in our schools. Are we going back or aren't we? A lot of people had put a lot of effort into it. The minister had, in fact, gazetted on the Friday that the, the return date is the 1st of June. So we said, we're going ahead. We're ready. We, uh, the, the, the National Education Collaboration Trust that the minister had appointed to um, oversee the readiness in provinces also confirmed that us and Gauteng were, were predominantly, overwhelmingly ready. So we decided to go ahead on the basis of the Minister's Gazette uh, to, to, mm. to continue and that if there were schools that aren't ready and hadn't complied, we would assist them this week to do that. Mm. And how did it go, Debbie? I mean, it's been two days now. Um, look, there was a lot of confusion and there's, there's a lot of anxiety in, in our schools amongst mm -hmm. our teachers and parents. Um, but, I mean, 98% of our schools did, in fact, open yesterday. Uh, some of them didn't for various reasons and, uh, you know, they are now be required to do so. Um, but, I mean, we didn't get figures of all the learners. You know, obviously a lot of learners didn't go yesterday. Um, but it actually went far better than I expected, to be honest. OK, well, that's good. And so, Debbie, I mean, let's just talk a little bit about the Human Rights Commission. I mm -hmm. see now you've uh, been asked... Uh, by the Human Rights Commission to respond, even though you followed the Gazette to the letter. I believe there's a new set of regulations that we published, which has the first end of the date. What is the Human Rights Commission's uh, beef here? I'm really, really, really battling to understand that, John, because, you know, the Human Rights Commission is supposed to protect human rights. And mm. one of the fundamental human rights in the Bill of Rights is the, the right to education. So we are providing mm. the right to education. We're working with the National Minister to do that. We uh, are complying with the Gazette, but now suddenly they feel that if all schools across the entire country can't open at the same time, now suddenly no school must. Uh, you know, that's, mm. uh, that's somehow like, a, like having a car with a flat tire, saying mm. that we must now make all the other flat tires flat instead of fixing mm. the one that's flat. And we just don't buy into that. They actually asked me formally in writing to give them undertaking this week that uh, that we will not continue with teaching in schools, even if learners come to for orientation, that we will not be teaching them any work this week, um, which in our view is, is contrary to the Constitution and our mandate. So it will be very interesting to know how many human rights commissioners have got children in the Western Cape and whether they went back to school this week. I mean, that would be an interesting thing to explore, I imagine. Well, John, the interesting part is that, uh, you know, Commissioner Andre Gaum, who is the one writing us this letter and is, is in, you know, um, telling TV about the complaint, um, his child has gone back, in fact, uh, yesterday and today at one of our schools. So I'm, I'm a bit surprised as to why he's not wanting us to teach when his child is going. So it doesn't seem... I can't quite reconcile that attitude. So it's almost like what's good for some people is not good for others. I mean, it's just a bit of a hypocrisy there. Well, yeah. I'm sure he's going to have a bit of explaining to do around that. And um, strength to your arm in terms of, of, of that letter. So look, let's get to this now because, you know, you've seen on social media, Twitter and all these other you know, platforms, people talking about, well, why is the, you know, you report to the Minister of Education, why are you defying her regulations? Uh, do you want to just take us through yeah. the whole element of concurrent <laughs> powers and how they work? Look, I understand. I mean, I am a lawyer and the concept of concurrent competency is not an easy one to understand. But there are a number of things in our constitution that provide for provinces to have quite a, a, large, a large amount of power. Uh, and education, basic education is one of those. Health is another one of those. So I don't report to the minister um, at all in the sense of I'm, I'm not answerable immediately to her. I am appointed by our premier, Ellen Windy. Obviously, in certain respects, I report to her and she requires certain things for monitoring purposes. And she's got to lay the legal framework for the country and, and so on. So one of the things that, that is within her sole competency is to decide on the school calendar every year. And uh, that is why she also had to make the decision, as well as the fact that it is now a disaster mm. when schools should reopen. So um, it's, it's actually completely not true that, I'm, that we're defying her anyway. I mean, she, she has gazetted the 1st of, of, of June. Mm. Um, and we've been working with her all the way to comply mm. with that. And we're one of, you know, basically two provinces that have. So I'm confused as to why the DA in the Western Cape is being so targeted for doing what we were asked to do by the national minister. Mm. And people aren't asking why the other provinces aren't ready. Yeah, I think that's the bigger question. Why was the Western Cape ready 
And why were so many other provinces not ready? I mean, how did you manage and oversee the rollout of the PPE, et cetera? It's been very difficult. And that's why I was so um, concerned when the possibility of maybe not going back on time was, was raised because it's a lot of anxiety going on and people prepare and then they have to change their mind and they prepare and they have to change their mind. Our officials have been working literally night and day, weekend in and weekend out mm. to ensure that these are procured. We had to get, you know, there's a, a, a worldwide shortage of some of um, items. We procured two masks for every single child in this province, two masks for every single government employed teacher in this province. And my HOD was literally sitting on people's <laughs> case yeah. to make sure that it was provided. He was following up personally to make sure that it was there. Mm -hmm. And then other provinces, just they, they're still busy fighting over who's going to get the tender for the PPE. Yeah. Well, I think that's the problem. You know, everyone's been squabbling over the spoils. So, uh, Debbie, in terms of, uh, of the issue around uh, governing bodies and the unions, now the unions seem to have had a huge amount of power and, and this seems to have essentially boiled down to a power play between the minister and the unions, and it looks like the unions have won round one. Yeah, John, I mean, we've all know how Satu has been running the department for a long time now, and uh, but what really concerned me this time is all the other unions joining in with them. Mm. Um, and that worried me a lot because people have been told, don't go to school. Um, members, teachers have been told by their unions, don't go to school, don't cooperate with the department, don't do this, don't do that, don't screen learners, make sure that the department does as if the department is some kind of mm. entity on its own. I mean, the teachers are members of the department. Mm -hmm. And we, in a crisis like this, we all need to really work together. So um, I was really surprised. I mean, I must say we all know, but to have witnessed personally that the announcement on Sunday night was being made by Satu, that the that learners weren't coming back until the 8th, I thought mm -hmm. was completely out of place um, and, and shows really who is in control. Well, I mean, it's just one, it's the latest in a series of flip-flops that we've seen throughout the management of this crisis. So mm -hmm. you have the president announces one thing, mm -hmm. his ministers announce another. Mm -hmm. You have the minister announces one thing, the unions announce another. And, you know, in, yeah. in a time of crisis like this, you really need unambiguous, clear information. And I know that, I mean, I'm a parent myself. I know there was a massive scrabble on Sunday night now. Now yeah. nobody knows, is the school opening? Is it not opening? And it mm -hmm. caused mass confusion uh, on the day. Yeah, it was very confusing. Um, it was unfortunate. Um, the minister has apologised and I do accept she's under immense pressure. We all are. So mm. let's move forward from that. But it was very concerning that Satu was mm. making that announcement. Making that announcement. So let's talk about what preparations have been made for Western Cape schools and why you feel they were, they, they were ready to open. <laughs> Yeah, as I say, we've we've spent um, nearly 230 million rand um, or more, actually, I think 280 million rand on, on procuring PPE and equipment, sanitizer, bleach, and it's you know. Uh it's not always easy to understand the scale of running a department like ours. We have mm. a million, 100,000 children in the system. We have 1,500 schools. A lot of them are rural. And to have been able to procure all those, those uh, you know, materials and then distribute those to the schools, mm. we did actually eventually say to some schools, please come and fetch it from our district offices. But we did absolutely everything possible. So we procured masks, we procured sanitizers, bleach. Um, and we've also put a huge amount of effort into uh, developing circulars that we've sent to the schools as to how they must manage the situation, how they must um, handle the situation if they have a positive case in a school, mm -hmm. how they must keep the, dis the distance from, for the children. Uh, also, um, how they must deal with the curriculum, how they must do the screening. We've even developed an app for screening for teachers. Unfortunately, the app can't take as much data for all the learners. Mm -hmm. But it's an amazing initiative that our health department, mm -hmm. together with us, we've adapted it for school. Mm -hmm. And we've also using our, our system in uh, schools, our SEMA system, so that, they, uh, that the teachers can upload the information for every child. We have a record of, uh, for example, their temperatures and so on. So mm -hmm. we, we've really put a huge amount of effort in, and the vast majority of our schools have done so too. And I really want to thank them for that. Yeah, okay. Um, so Debbie, um, let's talk about ECDs because I've got a query coming in through from Natalie. <laughs> what about ECDs being left to hang out in the cold? Now, obviously my <laughs> daughter's an ECD age and obviously there's an interest for me to know. What is the story with ECDs? And a lot of people don't understand why it's separate from the Department of Education. Yeah, it's a bit difficult because part of ECD is within our department and that is grade yeah. R, um, that is in the Schools Act, but the rest of them really are um, fall under the Department of Social Development. There is a move to change that and we are in discussions between the two departments as to how that can be done, but then Corona hit us. Mm -hmm. So at the moment, um, the, the Minister's Gazette last week um, said that ECD would start in July, 6th of July. 
But she sub subsequently clarified that now in the Gazette was, that was published last night to say um, that it's only EC grade R or below in a school. Mm -hmm. So anything that's in a private ECD centre still falls under the Department of Social Development. Uh, this Minister Lindy Wezulu, and we know that she's really more worried about not being able to shop than actually sorting out yeah. the ECD sector. Yeah, so that is, a, that is a bit of a problem. And I suppose if there's ever now a case to incorporate ECD into the mm -hmm. education uh, stream, I think it probably makes... It's complicated. Sense, yeah. um, it's, it's, it's complicated. It's mm -hmm. a very complex environment. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of unregistered ECD centres mm -hmm. um, and there are a lot of issues. You know, we, we are involved in curriculum and uh, mm -hmm. that's another debate. But yeah, that's yeah. Uh, that is unfortunately the current situation. And she needs to now make a decision as people are desperate. They want to go back to work. They haven't mm -hmm. got anywhere for their children to go. Even some of our teachers, mm -hmm. you know, they're also waiting. And this, so let's just deal with the other misconception that's doing the run. I had interaction with uh, a, a voter yesterday on Facebook sort of saying, why are you forcing our children to go back to school? Let's just talk about choice mm. and the choice that's before parents. Yeah. Um, once again, the president made an announcement that parents would not be forced to send their children to school, but unfortunately the president can't override the, lo the law of the country. Now, the law mm. says that every child between 7 and 15 has to be in school. Mm. There is an option for the HOD to make an exemption, but then that is generally regarded as for homeschooling, which is very specifically dealt mm. with in, in the legislation. So mm. what I have done is I've asked the minister to consider a bit of an interim solution for this because of the anxieties and the situation that we are in at the moment to perhaps allow the, um, uh, the parents for a period of time, it cannot be an indefinite situation, to allow for parents to be able to, if they are prepared to, um, to look after mm -hmm. their own interests of their children, make sure that they do the work at home, get it from the school, take it back to the school. They can't fall on teachers. Uh, and if the school is able to support it, but mm -hmm. it hasn't yet been the subject of a gazette and I'm, I'm hoping mm -hmm. it will still be. I have raised it with the minister, but at the mm -hmm. moment, they must either go or they must uh, apply for formal homeschooling. Yeah. Okay, well, Dominique asked the question, why are schools open uh, yet Parliament isn't open? Well, Parliament is actually open mm. and it's practising social distancing. Mm. But a little bit later in the show, uh, we've got uh, Dr. Kritzinger on, who's mm. going to take us through uh, why it is safer to open with younger mm. kids than it is with adults, but yes. we'll get to that. Mm. Uh, but I sat in the first virtual sitting of Parliament and actually I, I was physically there and there was social distancing practiced. So Parliament is open mm. and uh, we've had our first question session. Um, Bulumko asks here, what are the health protocols that have been put in place? So what does an average school day look like now with the added protocols? Um, what I've seen at some schools when I went to visit last week is that, first of all, um, schools, a lot of them, I can't say all, I haven't been to all 1,500, but they are putting in place measures for when the learners arrive, first of all. They are limiting the access points to one, one entrance so people can't slip around into a different one. They will then be met by screeners who will then um, screen them for their temperature. They will ask them the, the questions about having the coughs and uh, fever or if they've been in contact with somebody every single day before they go, to school, go into class. Uh, the desks have been moved to ensure that there's one and a half meters between every learner. They've been provided with masks, which they will be required to wear, obviously not when they're eating, but then they will keep the distance, which we have been advised is, is adequate protection. Mm -hmm. Um, schools are also ensuring that they're even trying to make different plans for break time so they don't run around playing catching games, for example, trying to work out what they can do instead to keep the children entertained without doing that. They will be supervised to make sure that that happens. Um, there's sanitizers available in every school, I think, mm -hmm. in, in fact, in every class. Uh, there is uh, ongoing education about um, what they must do, hand washing, how important that is, how the virus actually spreads. And in fact, I had feedback yesterday from a parent who was delighted when his child came back. He said he's so well informed now about this virus and what to do mm -hmm. about it. He was he was actually overflowing with excitement. Yeah. So we really we really have put in place absolutely everything we can. Yeah. Fiona writes in and thinks that 98 percent of the province is not ready. Uh, that your audits in your department would show something completely different. So how was the readiness checked and, and what is the level of readiness? Well, it's not only our department. We uh, we've um, obviously have our own monitoring, and we've been tracking and um, we're getting reports from our HOD as to where um, the materials have been delivered to which schools. But as I said, uh, the minister, the national minister, actually uh, appointed the National Education Collaboration Trust, which is an independent organisation, to come and do some monitoring on their own. And they were uh, in a lot of contact with us last week, and we're doing exactly that. And in fact, yesterday at the minister's press conference, confirmed that we were together with Gauteng over overwhelmingly ready. I think we were 97%. So that is completely mm -hmm. incorrect. Okay, well, there we go. Fiona, you've got your answer to that one there. Um, 
Arthur from Heart FM wants to know, what's your response to the Assuming Rights Commission that you can't continue with teaching? Are you going to carry on with teaching? I am not going to, my, my mandate is to make sure that children are educated. It's a fundamental right in the, in the Constitution. I will not stop anybody who wants to teach a child who is complying with the National Minister's Government Gazette and the security and safety precautions that we put in place unless a court tells me to stop. So no, okay. we will not. Okay, well that's very good, Debbie. Thank you very much. Debbie, let's talk about um, the school feeding scheme. And mm. I mean, this was one of the, the first early clashes that, that we had with mm. national government. Uh, and the province. Mm. How many children are being fed by this feeding scheme and how integral is it towards to, to keeping uh, child nutrition in this province moving? It's very integral um, and that's, that was the difficult part. We normally feed around 485,000 children every day across the province mm -hmm. um, and as soon after the lockdown it was very evident that people were, were really struggling that the uh, Department of Social Development nationally, SASA, SASA, closed their offices in the height of a crisis, mm -hmm. a humanitarian crisis, where they are the mm -hmm. agency required to help people in trouble, they closed their offices. So people were really, really battling. And as a result of that, we, as our provincial cabinet, we had discussions about how we could alleviate that. And one of the options was to try and use our feeding program and the infrastructure we have there to ensure that we do feed mm -hmm. learners. Obviously, we couldn't do all of them, unfortunately, because Many of them are bust and they come from far and we didn't have the learner transport. So we, had, we made a decision. Uh, we were told we couldn't use the national school nutrition budget. So we had to reallocate some of our very meager provincial budget to that. And we did that for uh, two or three weeks. And, and we fed about 100,000 children a week, every week who would otherwise not have had food. Uh, we put every single measure in place that we possibly could. We had distancing. I had photos from up the west coast of these poor little children sitting so desperate for food, sitting away from each other with their little bowls waiting and they were mm. so good and one of my circuit managers even reported that they were reduced to tears when they saw how desperate mm. these children were for food yeah so well done i hope it continues and i hope it goes from strength to strength debbie an interesting question here from amanda can a private school decide to open and continue via distance learning uh, and no contact school for the winter months um, I don't see why not, because private schools can, they have a lot more freedom, mm. obviously. We, ha we just, uh, they have to register with mm. our department, um, and as long as they, they f comply with the basics, they can really mm. do what they like as long as they comply with the law. Mm. Yesterday, the minister did gazette an amendment, which also allows for schools to apply to take in other grades, not just the, the, the prescribed grades of 7 mm. and 12, if they comply with the requirements and have to apply to the HOD. So I don't see why not if, they, if okay. they've got the appropriate method, mechanisms okay. in place. Well, that brings me to another question here from Sybil, who asks, do you have dates yet for grade 6 and grade 10? We do. They were all in the Gazette. Um, grade 6, um, I can't recall all of them. Some of them are on the 6th of July. Some of them are in, in the beginning of well, August. Well, what we'll do is we'll put the Gazette sure, up on I'll the website afterwards. Perfect. So, yeah. Sybil, um, I'll give you the address at the end of the show and you can, you can have a look there. Let's, I think this is a good time to bring in our second guest yes. of today because I think that uh, you know, there's nothing like a good bit of medical uh, uh, scientific, uh, evidence. scientific evidence to, to get to the heart of it. And it gives me huge, huge pleasure to introduce Dr. Fiona Kritzinger and welcome her to CoronaCast. Docs, uh, Dr. Kritzinger is a pediatric pulmonologist and uh, works at the uh, the. Uh, uh, chest and allergy clinic at Chris Barnard Hospital and it's a great pleasure to have you on today. Welcome to CoronaCast, Fiona. Thank you very much. Do you want to just start off by telling us what you do and, and, and a bit of what the work the centre does? Yes, so yes, as you said, I'm a pediatric pulmonologist and I am fortunate to, in our centre, we um, specifically look at children's lung conditions, respiratory conditions, and allergic conditions. So I work with two wonderful other professionals, um, Dr. Gray and Dr. Carabas. And um, we're all pediatricians and we subspecialized in these um, fields. Um, and that's what we do every day. We here, we've been here all through the lockdown. We've been continuing our practice and our work. Well, Fiona, thanks very much. And, you know, as a pediatrician, you've done a number of interviews and I've seen some of them about why children should return to school and why they are at significantly lower risk. Um, do you want to talk to us a little bit about that and why the risk of child infection is low and why you think children should be going back to school? Yeah, thanks for that. Yes, as you rightly said, I initially um, did some interviews in my personal capacity, but also over time, 
the consensus grew amongst uh, us as a pediatric community. And you may have seen over the weekend the media uh, statement that was released by SAPA, which is the South African Pediatric Association, that really sums up how we as a pediatric community feel. And I think the first uh, thing I just want to say is uh, we are fully aware of the anxiety and the fear that exists. Mm -hmm. Uh, and by now is really instilled in the hearts of many parents. And we have been fielding their questions for some time now. Um, but just to put it in perspective, at the start of the, of the crisis, a lot of what was decided at the time was not based on, on science from COVID because we didn't have any data to, to base it on. It was based on assumptions that on previous epidemics, either previous SARS epidemics or then the seasonal flu epidemics that we have each year. And so the decisions were made to close down schools. The assumption was made that children will be super spreaders of the, the virus as they are for other viral infections. And the assumption was made that children will be worse affected because we know that with other respiratory viruses, a lot of children will get sick from RSV virus, influenza virus, and so forth. As time went by and more data came to be published, primarily from what happened in China and then moved over to Europe and now the United States, we actually came to realize that many of our assumptions was incorrect as far as COVID goes. So one was the risk of infection to children. And what we've seen is that for reasons that we haven't ex um, completely um, teased out yet, children for biological reasons seems to be less infected than children. So if you look at the worldwide numbers at the moment, less than 1% in some instances, some studies is less than 3%, but a very low percentage of these cases are in children under the age of 18. So small, for, it certainly affects children less than 18, far, far less than the adult community. So that's the one thing. Then there was the concern that children will infect a lot of other people. And that has come to also being shown not to be true. So in some of the household cluster studies, um, we were able to find or see that only 10% of households had a child as an index case in a household. So 90% of the time, the index case or the contact case in the household was an adult and not a child. There were some uh, studies done in New South Wales where schools were not completely closed. I think the school had 780 odd students and staff members, and they had nine children and nine adults uh, who tested positive. And there were only two secondary cases uh, in that school as a total. Mm -hmm. So definitely the data that we have, and let's say that you know the data is, is hot off the press and the data is accumulating over time. But the data that we certainly have is showing the complete opposite to what we assumed. And then there's the, the risk of, um, we spoke about the risk of transmission, the risk of infection, but also the risk of serious symptoms. And again, we were very surprised to see that study after study showing that children is far less likely to have serious symptoms. So the, the vast majority of them can have completely asymptomatic. They may not show any symptoms. Then there's a big portion that will have mild symptoms, which is similar to what they may have had in the past with colds and flus. And if you take about a thousand children and they all have coronavirus, only two in that thousand children might require hospital care and you will be unlucky if, if there's any deaths in that group of, of a thousand children, which is a completely different scenario when you look in the adult world. So we were, as pediatricians, very uh, grateful, but surprised to see that children, in fact, have far less severe symptoms. Yeah. So all in all, when you look at the risk um, of infection to begin with, the risk of transmitting the virus, the risk of getting significantly sick, and obviously the risk of death 
is completely different in school going children, in fact, in all children younger than 18, than what we are seeing in the adult data. Mm -hmm. So that's looking at risk. Then we also have to look on the other side of how effective is the measures that were put in place? What data do we have to say that school closure is an effective intervention to spread the, the um, transmission of COVID? And the reality is that the science is completely lacking. Um, there is no data to say that closing schools in particular is extremely helpful on a, on a population level to stop the transmission of the virus. And in fact, some of the modeling studies that was done in the UK, but based on the data from China, suggested that only about 2% of all the deaths could have been prevented by school closure. So then if we then say, okay, well, what are the risks to the child with an, an extended school lockdown? You know, what, what price are the children paying for an intervention that does not seem to be necessary for their sake. You know, what we know that those who have been in an extended lockdown, as you've mentioned, a vast majority of children do not have any access to online education at home. I think the last statistics showed that only 20% of all learners had access to education during this two and a half months. The, the question is what around the safety of the children, the nutrition of the children, and the mental health of the children. And, and if you add to that, that coronavirus is going to be with us for a foreseeable future, then at what point in time do we actually stop punishing the children mm. with um, keeping education away from them? Mm. So I think if you do that risk benefit analysis for us as a pediatric community, the message is very clear that the benefits for children to return mm. to education far outweighs their risks. Mm. So if I hear you correctly, you, you would be saying that um, in terms of children, the risk is really low and it, the, the, there's greater harm in keeping children out of the school system and losing the academic year than they ever would be from, uh, from the virus, given the science uh, at this particular time. Now, look, I mean, obviously, as a, as a parent and as someone working with children every day, every sick child is, mm. is something we've got, we're worried about and we don't mm. like. Every death is, is tragic. Mm. But I think it's important to help to put it in perspective. And I, I, in my practice, try to say to parents last winter, what was your child's risk last winter for a serious respiratory illness mm. or in worst case scenario, death from a respiratory illness. And the reality is the estimates is that last year of the 11,000 influenza deaths in the country, about 550 were children, school going children. So that mm. gives you like 5% of the influenza deaths were mm. actually in school going age children. But yet last winter, no one took the flu vaccine no one took the children's temperature, no one screened mm. them for symptoms, no one wore a mask or washed mm. their hands. So relatively speaking, is mm. the risk to the child greater, mm. bearing in mind that schools have the ability to protect their learners mm. um, and the measures that was mentioned by the minister, mm. is that relative risk really greater than last year? And my personal opinion is no, in mm. many aspects, the risk to the child is actually much less. Okay. So mm -hmm. then you have to say that have to have access to education um, and to have access to stimulation and safety, because let's not forget that about 25 to 30% of essential workers and healthcare workers have child minding responsibilities. So what has been happening to those children? You know, if their parents have been at hospital working, where do they access care and, and safety? It's mm. probably their grandparents. So, you know, so there's on so many levels that, mm. that it is the right decision to open the schools. Would mm. have it have been ideal if it was summer now? Uh, yes, of course, but we don't have that choice. We, mm. they, we, that choice is not given to us. And to, to stay locked down and to keep the schools 
closed longer is just not um, responsible or <coughs> acceptable. <coughs> Dr. Kritzinger, there's a, a question here from Deloise who asks about comorbidities amongst children. So children with diabetes, children with asthma. Yeah. What would your advice in, in this regard be? Yeah, so you may have seen things circulating and a lot of that data, again, is based on the adult cases because 99% of all the COVID cases in the world is adults. And it's been very clear from the adult literature that obesity, heart disease, chronic lung disease, and immunosuppression, hypertension is significant comorbidities. When it comes to the pediatric data, um, the data is far less clear but I think it is safe, and we as a pediatric community also assumes that similar comorbidities will, will be present in children. It's interesting, though, that when you look at the data, some of the U.S. studies um, that reported on 350 kids, only about 40% of them had a, had a comorbidity. About 16% of them had asthma, um, but interestingly enough, obesity. So obesity mm -hmm. seems to be a risk factor even in school-going children. Mm -hmm. um, but some of the Italian studies, only a quarter of the hospitalized children had comorbidities. So I would still say that children with severe immunosuppression, children with severe cardiac disease or respiratory disease, children who are post-transplant, um, children who are uh, immunosuppressed, those are comorbidities. I think the big, the most common thing is obviously asthma. Asthma is one of the most, well, it is the commonest respiratory condition in children. But I would just want to clarify that mild or moderate asthma that is well controlled on medication per se is not a significant risk factor and is not a reason not to return to school. Mm. So there's a lot of questions coming in around masks, and I'm sure you've been uh, inundated at your practice uh, uh, about, about masks. What's better, masks or face shields? Uh, can yeah. you get carbon dioxide poisoning from wearing a mask too long? Uh, what is your, yeah. you, do you want to talk about kids and masks? Um, a lot of parents send yeah. stuff through about that. Yeah, so definitely we'd say children five years and older um, would become um, the age group where masks is should be wear, worn. Um, the big thing about a mask is that it, you have to wear it properly. You have to use it properly. Mm. So there's a lot of education needed to make sure the child actually wears the mask correctly and that it doesn't inadvertently make him touch his face more because it doesn't fit well if it falls off or it goes over his eyes. So I think a well-fitted mask works. It works well and it is completely safe, even to wear for extended periods of time. I mean, someone made the comment that, you know, doctors who operate for hours on you wear a mask for hours and they keep mm. doing very intricate and very complex mm. procedures and no doctor has ever passed out or died because he wore a mask <laughs> mask for hours before the mm. poisoning so it is safe to wear a mask but i think mm. that it must be the right age we children under the age of five should not be wearing masks unless the child is maybe emotionally mature and they're able to wear it correctly but definitely not a mm. mask over a child under the age of two years. Absolutely. There it's contraindicated. But in school going children, a mask is very effective, mm. provided it's worn correctly. Yeah. And what about teachers and their vulnerability? Uh, you know, uh, I, I, we were having a discussion in the break. You, I think you were saying a teacher is more vulnerable in the staff room than they are in the classroom. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So the children, uh, the adults, um, definitely are far more likely to get infected from other adults than they are from children. That's been shown in a, even in a household um, and even on a population level. So how the teacher gets to school and the behavior of the teacher is ultimately going to determine their risk. So if they follow social distancing, if they wear a mask appropriately, and if they wash their hands, they are protected. That is been shown over and over again that that's mm. the most effective strategy. Mm. Uh, and it's the intervention that works the best. Mm. So I think that the teachers need to be very careful about their behavior outside of the classroom. 
especially when they get into the staff room uh, and have meals or have breaks, um, because that's actually a bigger risk for them than the time that they spend in the classroom. With the children. Um, Pam's asking us a question here. What is the minimum requirement for a quality of mask for children? Would you, do you have a sort of a standard uh, recommendation? Yeah look, yeah, look, I think actually the, the Department of Health in the Western Cape sent out a very helpful link to what is considered a good cloth mask. But you basically want three layers. You know, you want a very tightly woven material on the outside and then the layer in the middle and the layer um, in inside. Mm. But more importantly, obviously, those masks must be washed every day at a high temperature and preferably ironed because that will help to, to kill all the remaining viruses. Mm. So there's lots of um, good quality information. Also, there's lots of patterns to make your own mask. Mm. So I think we can maybe share that at the end of the, the mm. show. Yeah. Well, great. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kritzinger, and it's been really great to have you on. And I would love to have you back on it again uh, at, a, at another time to discuss where we're at. Obviously, the science is moving all the time. And, you know, this is a point exactly. I made in the show two shows ago that, you know, you've got to, government's got to be alive to the moving science. I mean, you know, I, I think back exactly. at the beginning of the AIDS pandemic, some people's view on ARVs and, and the relationship between HIV and AIDS but completely, the science moved completely on it. And I think government's got to keep up with the cutting edge of uh, and be informed by the science. No, for sure, we, we cannot ignore it. I think we also have to acknowledge that we do not have all the answers and the data that we base our answers on is going to change. And we, as the scientific community and the pediatric community is keeping a very, very close eye in every day of what is published, what is circulating amongst our peers, and how we should mm. change our recommendations. Mm. Um, so we are committed to finding mm. uh, the correct data and mm. spreading the correct information. And we are very aware that anxiety and fear is difficult to control. Mm. And therefore, I think all of us have a responsibility to put the data um, into a context that allows parents to find mm. some some degree of calm and rationality because mm. also unfortunately some media continues to spread fake news and poor information mm. and fuels the anxiety and the fire you know mm. which yeah. is not very helpful not very helpful at all well thank you dr kritzinger and obviously anyone uh, wanting to access your practice have you got a website or how do people get in touch with your practice Yes, yes, we do have a website. It's just chestandallergy.co.za and also um, SAPA, the South African Pediatric Association, mm. is busy getting their platforms, but they can be followed on Facebook and Instagram and on their website. Um, and yeah, I think parents, I would suggest that they try and get the information from reputable sources and try yes. and stay away yeah. from um, non-scientific sources. Yeah. Well, I think that's excellent advice. And thank you for making time for us and for our viewers today, Dr. Kritzinger. And I look forward to welcoming you back. Debbie, that, I mean, that, was, that should definitely give you some pause for, uh, pause for thought there. And, you know, anything you want to say? In terms of, I, I imagine this is a science that led to, to you guys moving towards the opening. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's extremely encouraging. And yes, I mean, I think people think that we really sit in our offices and don't know what's going on out there. And that just really isn't, isn't the case. We actually really are concerned about every one of our teachers mm. and children. And of course, as I said, it wasn't our decision in the Western Cape that schools will now start to reopen. That was made by the National Minister in mm. consultation with the Coronavirus uh, Command Council, who are informed all the time by the, the medical experts, such as Dr. Kritzinger, as well as Dr. Karim. And Dr. Karim has also been, has come out in favor of it. So it's not something that's been made rashly at all. Mm. And we do acknowledge the anxieties, but it's very encouraging to hear, to hear what uh, Dr. Kritzinger had to say, absolutely. Yeah. Um, do you have an idea, Dr. Hart from do you have an idea what the percentage of, of learners went back? Obviously it's early days still yesterday. No, I mean, out of, out of the ones who should have gone back. Yeah. No, I didn't get those figures yesterday. Okay. We, have, we haven't. But I'm sure they'll be out in a little bit. I did hear some, some anecdotal evidence that yeah. it was even more improved today. Um, but, okay. but generally, in some schools, there were a lot of them we went back um, but I, yeah. I can't give an honest and yeah. accurate uh, total at the moment. Yeah. No. But I mean you can understand the anxiety of parents. I Absolutely. mean I think I mean, you're a mother of, uh, <laughs> of two lovely daughters 
I mean, they are our, you know, our, our care and our asset, and we yeah. always want what's best for them. But Absolutely. I think it's a balance. I think it's what Dr. Kritzinger spoke about: a risk-benefit analysis that you've got to do, and you've got to make a rational decision. It's got to be rational. The primary interests have to be safety mm. of our teachers yeah. and our children, but yeah. there are many, many, many factors to consider, yeah. as well as you know, also the emotional issues for teachers too. I think people there, there is a mm. lot of evidence about emotional consequences of lockdown across the world, mm. and economic, you know, the yeah. economic and educational people. People don't want to hear about it. They think that we're saying that you can measure a life in, in terms of money, which is obviously mm. not true. Mm. But uh, research has been done in, a, in a, the Brookings Institution in the, in the US on the economic impact, which mm. also is one of the factors to consider. Sure. And that is if a child misses out on four months of schooling mm. in a year, that equ equates to something 2.5 trillion US dollars lost to the economy. And it affects the child's education in the sense that they have gaps mm -hmm. that they will not necessarily catch up later on. Yeah. Um, and so it affects their entire schooling career later mm -hmm. on as well. So that is one of the factors, but obviously mm -hmm. the primary one is safety. Yeah. Well, we had Belinda Bazzoli, who you've been working with mm -hmm. on our education work stream on, and she was making the point about uh, why it is important to save the academic year mm -hmm. and the bunching that mm -hmm. would happen mm -hmm. uh, in schools, massive mm -hmm. classes. Mm -hmm. But she also said something very interesting that um, Children who don't finish this year, particularly in vulnerable communities, would be very unlikely to re-enroll the following year. There are a lot of complications. It's not, you know, some people say, well, I don't keep, I'll keep my child home and they'll, they can just repeat. Well, we know the, the reality is we have another 100,000 children coming into the system next year into mm. grade one. Uh, so where are they going to go if, the, if the, all the people mm. were to repeat? And you can't just say they're gonna, they must stay back another year because then that holds them back for another year. Mm. And when you weigh those factors up, we don't have enough teachers as it is in the, in the system. We don't have enough classrooms. Mm. So where are we going to put these people? Um, so, mm. you know, that certainly is a factor and it's a, it's a very real factor uh, that we need to take into account. And when you hear mm. what Dr. Kristinger says, that the risks are very low. It's not just justifiable to continue. I mean, the other thing is people say, well, it's not safe. So I say, well, when will it be safe? Mm. No, maybe after the peak. Mm. But you know, after the peak, it's not as if the virus is going to disappear. Mm. The virus mm. will still be here. And, and the reality is viruses move with people. So the more people come out, so you can lock down for six months. But if the virus still exists out there, when people come mm. back, it will then start picking up again. Mm. So it it's a, it's a really is a balancing act. And we've mm. got to take advice with the medical experts, which we are doing. Yeah. Well, Debbie, thank you very much for being on the show today. And thanks for the work that you're doing. As again, I'm sort of uh, very, uh, very in awe of your bravery and, and, your, and your, uh, your resolve. And I, it's very rare in politics to have politicians who stick to what they say they're going to do and make sure that they, they hang to their commitments. So thank well you, done. Thank you very much. Uh, and keep up the good work. And we'll obviously have you back on the show and Great. Uh, to come and talk about how it's going. But thank you for the work that you're doing in the Western Cape. And thanks again for leading the way. Uh, yeah. the, thank you. Great. Great. Well, everybody, I'm sure you found that as fascinating and interesting as I did. And uh, thanks for those of you who've stayed uh, tuned. And I think uh, both uh, the minister and Dr. Kritzinger have provided a wealth of information for us to think about. Uh, our children are our most precious uh, asset and resource. Uh, and obviously, uh, their, con their health and well-being is always uppermost as parents. Um, I want to give my shout out today to all those teachers in the Western Cape who were back at their schools and back teaching their classes uh, the, the, during the course of this week. I'm sure for many of you, it wasn't an easy decision, uh, but thank you for your commitment to growing the future of South Africa uh, and tending to those young minds and those young lives uh, that, are that are essentially hold the future of our country uh, in their hands. Well, that's it, uh, folks, for this week, and uh, we look forward to seeing you back on Friday again for another interesting episode of Corona Cost. Uh, same time, same place. Until then, stay safe, South Africa.